Okay, this video is the second uh, video reviewing basic antiderivatives. So on the previous video, we looked at these first three antiderivative rules. So the power rule, the log rule, and the exponential rule. We also looked at these additional properties that allowed us to split up addition and subtraction and pull constant multiples out of integrals. Um, all of the rules are just the exact reverse of differentiation rules that you learned in Calc 1. Um, today what we want to look at, or in this video what we want to look at, is the six trig rules and the two inverse trig rules. So if you look at the middle of the page, um, or the middle of the screen, you have these six trig rules that come from the derivative rules. So uh, the negative signs you've got to be a little bit careful with. So when you think about the derivative of sine, the derivative of sine is positive cosine. That actually leads to the second rule that the antiderivative of cosine is positive sine. So because the derivative of sine is cosine, the antiderivative of cosine is sine. And then this first rule comes from the derivative of cosine. So because the derivative of cosine is negative sine, the antiderivative of sine is negative cosine. And so those are both easy rules to apply, but they're easy to get backward because the negative sign is kind of backward from what might be intuitive at first. Um, when you look at the other rules, the derivative of tangent is secant squared. And so the antiderivative of secant squared is tangent. The derivative of cotangent is negative cosecant squared. So the antiderivative of cosecant squared is negative cotangent. And then similarly on the last two, the derivative of secant is secant tangent. So the antiderivative of secant tangent is secant. And then the derivative of cosecant is negative cosecant cotangent. So the antiderivative of cosecant cotangent is negative cosecant x plus c. So we'll use those rules a good bit. Um, they're a little bit weirder to apply, and we'll talk kind of why that is here in a few minutes. And then you have these last two rules, the inverse trig rules that come up a lot. Uh, because the derivative of inverse tangent is 1 over 1 plus x squared, the antiderivative of 1 over 1 plus x squared is inverse tangent. And then the derivative of inverse sine is 1 over the square root of 1 minus x squared. So the antiderivative of 1 over the square root of 1 minus x squared is uh, inverse sine of x. So it's actually important that we know these rules. So they should be things you've memorized from Calc 1. Um, if not, you definitely need to memorize these rules. Um, it, it's These are going to come up a lot. So these, there's 11 forms. There's kind of the three basic forms. You've got the six trig forms and the two inverse trig forms that we'll use quite a bit in this class. Uh, there are other forms, but these are the 11 that we'll stick to. So no matter how complicated the problems get, no matter how complicated the techniques get, we'll always break them down into these 11 rules. The additional properties at the bottom let you split more complicated problems up into the ones that we uh, know how to do, which are these 11. Okay, so I want to move to the next page, man, and I don't want to mess with that picture. So let's do this. Man, there we go. Um, and I want to look at uh, these four problems. So if you want to take a second and get them written down, you can pause the video and do that. Um, we're going to work the solutions out um, now. And so these four match the basic forms either exactly or almost exactly. So the integral of cosine is uh, sine x plus c. It's positive sine because the derivative of sine is positive cosine. The antiderivative of sine is negative cosine because the derivative of cosine is negative sine. And so both of those are easy problems. They're just very easy to get backward because of the negative signs. On problem three, cosecant cotangent is one of the forms we know how to do. And so we can pull the five out of this. And the antiderivative of cosecant cotangent is negative cosecant x. And so we get negative 5 cosecant x plus c. And on problem 4, secant squared is a form we know how to do. And so we get 3 times the antiderivative of secant squared x dx. The antiderivative of secant squared is tangent x. And so we get 3 tangent x plus c. Okay, so all four of those are fairly straightforward. What makes the trig rules 
most of the time harder for students and harder for people in general, me included, um, is that the forms, two, two things. One, the forms are weird. So if we go back up and look at the forms, uh, it's like sine x is easy, which would make sense, and cosine x is easy, but secant squared is easy, and we don't have a form for secant. <clears throat> secant times tangent is easy, but tangent by itself is not. Uh, cosecant co times cotangent is easy, but cosecant's not. Cosecant squared is there, but cosecant's not. And so two big reasons these tend to be harder. One is the forms, other than sine and cosine, the forms are weird. So they're relatively odd forms that we're trying to match. And then the second thing is almost nobody is perfectly comfortable with trig identities. So manipulations for the ones we were doing in the video before for power functions and exponential functions, those are things that we're pretty used to and you pretty much do the same thing every time. When you're dealing with trig, there's a lot of different identities that we should know from trig and people tend to not be as comfortable with them. I'm not as comfortable with them as I am with algebra and that's completely understandable. Um, but we need to be able to work with them and you don't don't do the same thing every time. So a lot of times the strategies to write in terms of sine and cosine, that's not always the best way to do it. And that's not always the only way to do it. Um, and so we're going to look at several problems. And I want you to look at these six problems and I want you to attempt them. So I want you to take a few minutes. So actually pause the video and try these problems. And of these six problems, I want you to use identities and try to match the forms that we've got. Um, but we shouldn't have to use any technique beyond what we've learned so far. So if you know more advanced things like U sub or integration of parts, then we could technically do all of these problems. But based on what we've done so far, there's at least one of these that you will be able to do if you use the right manipulation. There's also at least one of these that's too hard based on what we've done, that without more advanced techniques, we cannot do them. So for now, I want you to write too hard on the one or two or three problems that you can't do. There's, you can do some and you cannot do at least one. And so I want you to take a few minutes and really try these, mess with the identities, see what you can do. So please stop the video, pause the video, work for a few minutes, do what you can with these, and then I'll work them out, the ones that we can do here in just a minute. Okay, so let's go through these problems. So on the first problem, it turns out you can do it. And the reason you can do it is because tangent over cosine is the same thing as tangent times secant. So one over cosine is the same thing as secant, which means we can rewrite it that way. Well, that's secant x tangent x, obviously. And that's one of the forms we can do. So the antiderivative of secant tangent whoops, no integral anymore, is secant x plus c. And that's the answer. Tangent squared is another one we can do based on what we've done. So if we remember from trig, 1 plus tangent squared is the same thing as secant squared. And so manipulating that, we can rewrite tangent squared as secant squared minus 1. split this into two problems. Antiderivative of secant squared is tangent. Oops. Now let's make it so you can read it. And the antiderivative of 1 dx is just x. So we get tangent x minus x plus c. Okay, so we can make both of those. Um, number seven is actually one that you can't. So you might have thought to do sine over cosine, which is what you end up doing. But this one's too hard for now. You have to use what's called U substitution. And if you've already learned that, you can do the problem. But it's too hard for what we're doing right now. We'll, we'll get to tangent in a uh, future video, or at least we'll get to those techniques in a future video. Um, cosecant squared is already a basic form. So the antiderivative of cosecant squared is negative cotangent. So there's no manipulation involved at all. But the point is cosecant squared is very easy. Tangent squared is moderate, but tangent to the first is not something we can do using basic forms. Um, on number nine, 
we can rewrite the problem as 16 integral 1 over cosine squared, but 1 over cosine squared is the same thing as secant squared. The antiderivative of secant squared is tangent, and so we get 16 tangent x plus c. On number 10, without some identities and basic u substitution, this one's also too hard for now. And so there's not a technique using just the basic forms to do problem 10, or at least none I'm aware of. If you come up with a more creative solution than I've got, let me know that, and uh, I will maybe let you know if it's right or not, or we'll determine together whether it's right or not. But without u substitution, you can't do 7 and 10. Okay. So again, kind of the point of these problems are we're, we have to get used to working with the identity. So like on um, number five, we rewrote cosine as uh, one over cosine as secant. Um, on number six, we didn't write it as sine over cosine. We rewrote it as secant squared minus one. On number seven, we haven't done that yet, but we would rewrite it as sine over cosine and then use u substitution later. Um, so there's not a consistent strategy. Um, you try to make it match these forms, but what's difficult about them is the forms are a little bit weird and so this gets better with practice but but we need to allow ourselves so when you're doing these problems work with them you're not going to be given a problem on a quiz or a test or a homework even where you can't do the problem using the techniques we've done and so if you start it and you're not getting anywhere take a break for a few minutes go back again and try it again from the beginning you might have to restart these problems with a different approach um, there's not a good way to just get really good at them, but just practicing more with them, you'll get better with them. Okay, so the last two forms um, that I want to look at are the two forms that I've got in blue there, uh, the inverse tangent form and the inverse sine form. Um, and just because I want to uh, work with the algebraic manipulations. So I want to look at these five problems. And again, a couple of these are too hard to do based on what we've got right now, but I want to kind of look at the differences between them. So on number 11, we can factor out 7 thirds, and that leaves a 1 on top, and it leaves 1 plus x squared on the bottom. Um, it's x squared plus 1, but reverse just to match the form. Um, and then that's 7 thirds inverse tangent of x plus c. And that's all we do on 11. Um, on 12, we do something similar. We pull out 8 over the square root of 25. And that gets us 1 over the square root of 1 minus x squared inside. Square root of 25 is obviously 5. And so we get 8 fifths inverse sine x plus c. On number 13, um, we can pull out 3 over the square root of 10. And so that's not as nice as the square root of 25 because we can't simplify it, but you're allowed to have square root of 10 in an answer. And so we would have 3 over the square root of 10 times the inverse sine of x plus c on problem 13. Um, if you wanted to rationalize the denominator, you could. I'm going to choose not to on problem 13. And then it's important that these don't match. these forms. As written. Um, it, there's a good bit of manipulation that we'll do to do problems like 14 and 15, but the important part is we can't just simply make them match. So for inverse tangent to work and for inverse sine to work, the coefficients have to be the same on the bottom. So it has to be 3x squared plus 3. It cannot be 4x squared plus 3 because if you factor them out, you'll get different coefficient. You'll have a different coefficient on x squared than the 1. Um, same thing on inverse sine. The coefficients have to be the same and it has to be subtraction and it has to be in the right order. So if I have x squared minus 1 under the square root, that's not the same thing as 1 minus x squared, and so that won't work. You could factor a negative 1 out to reverse subtraction. Normally that would not be a problem, but in a square root that would be a problem. So it's important that even though 14 looks like 11, and even though 15 looks like 12 and 13, 
you cannot do them the same way. So uh, one running theme you'll see in the t videos on um, integrals, on techniques of integrals, is that a lot of times the problems themselves, doing the problem and doing the process is not what's hard. It's knowing how to do the problem and knowing what technique to use. So the fact that problem 11 and problem 14 look very, very similar, but have very different approaches means that um, it, it can be challenging to look at a problem and know what to do. Same thing with 12 and 13. Those two problems are about the same as each other, but they're a lot different from problem 15 because of a small change. Okay, so that's all the examples I wanted to do in this video. So what you should do now is the basic integral, uh, basic integration problem set two. That involves a lot of trig and inverse trig in those problems. All right, thanks for watching this video.